Good evening. My name is Miki Quinones. I'm the Dean of the Robbins School, and it's our pleasure to welcome you to the Insider's Guide to the Robbins School of Business. Uh, on behalf of my panelists, I just want to say it's been an absolute joy to have your students back on campus. I know it's been a little bit different, but it's been actually working quite well. Uh, we've all are just very pleased that we've made it this far, and we plan to make it all the way to Thanksgiving. Uh, learning is happening. Fun is being had. And, uh, and it's just great to be on campus, the most beautiful campus in the nation, according to Princeton Review. So thank you for being here. Uh, tonight, what we want to do is give you the opportunity to learn about the school and ask questions. This is the kind of session that we would have held uh, during family weekend. As you know, we're not having family weekends. So we want to make sure that we give you the opportunity to hear from uh, the school and ask questions. Um, you're going to hear from some of the individuals that your students are getting to know uh, in the business school on campus or are going to be getting to know over the next couple of years or next few months, actually. Uh, as we go through the panel, please feel free to use your Q&A function and uh, we'll go at the end and we'll uh, gather all those questions and, uh, and get answers from them. But as they come up, feel free to put them up there and I'll start kind of triaging them. So I appreciate that very much. All right, I'm going to introduce the panelists, and uh, as I introduce each one, just as a little fun, I'm going to ask them uh, what has been their go-to snack or go-to show during quarantine times. Uh, so as I mentioned before, my name is Mickey Quinones. I'm the dean of the Robin School, and I think my go-to show was Dark. Uh, my family and I got hooked on that show, and we went all the way through it. We didn't know that we were going to get into a show that had, it was in German, but it was actually quite interesting. Uh, I'll be presenting a little bit about the school, just give you an overview of uh, what we're about and what our philosophy is at the, at the Robin School. After that, uh, Joyce Vanderlaan Smith, who's our Associate Dean for Undergraduate Programs and uh, a professor in our accounting department. Joyce, you want to say hello and tell us your snack or show? Hi there. Um, I think I'll go with a favorite snack, and it's been popcorn with peanut butter M&Ms. Ah, all right. So Joyce will be talking about our faculty and what makes our uh, faculty special. Uh, after that, you'll hear from Laura Thompson, who's our Assistant Dean of Undergraduate Student Services. Laura, how about you? Oh, I, I guiltily confess that I watched the show Ozarks. So now I know way more than anyone should about money laundering. <laughs> Which is not part of the curriculum here at the Robin no, School of Business. No, it's not part of our curriculum. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. And Laura will be talking about how you get into the Robin School and what the curriculum is about. Uh, after that, you'll hear from Tom Cosse, our Associate Dean of International Programs and Professor in our Marketing Department. Tom, how about you? What about your COVID snack or show? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my, my COVID is uh, old, old shows. Uh, uh, I've grown especially fine of, again, I'm showing my age, of gun smoke. All right, excellent. So thank you, Tom. And Tom will be talking about our study abroad opportunities. We'll be showing a short uh, video. And yes, study abroad hopefully will happen in the spring, but certainly we will in the future. And it's a very important part of our school. After Tom, you'll hear from Shelly Burns. Uh, Shelly is our Director of Career Services here in the Business School. Shelly, how about you? Uh, good evening, everyone. So my go-to snack has been uh, peanut M&Ms. Ah, excellent. And Shelly will talk to you about all the ways in which we uh, uh, supplement our classroom, traditional classroom uh, instruction with experiential uh, elements uh, for professional skills development. So thank you, Shelley. And finally, you'll hear from Keith Webb from our University of Career Services. He's the Associate Director of Career Services and, uh, and certainly a member of the Robin School team. He has a, an office here that he comes and uh, meets with students outside of his regular office in Tyler Haynes. So how about Keith? What was, what's been your snack or show? Well, good evening, everyone. My favorite go-to lifetime snack are Twizzlers. Uh huh. You know, those are my kids' favorites, <laughs> Twizzlers. And Keith will be talking to you about sort of the end result is how do we get in, how do we help our students get jobs? So what we've lined up here is kind of from soup to nuts. What happens? How do you get in? Uh, what, what are we about? What about our faculty? How do you get in? And then what you experience while you're a Robin School student? And then how you get out and go out into the world? So let's jump right to it. So why are we here? What is the Robin School about? Um, this is what we all strive to do is to provide an exceptional business education. And the key words here are that we want to prepare our students to, uh, to perform and to make a difference in the world. And we want to inspire them to think about how they want to go out and make a difference 
uh, in their organizations, communities, and society. That's sort of our, our guiding principles and what we exist for. And how do we do this? We focus on four key things. One is excellence, doing things as best as we can and always striving for continuous improvement. We focus on relevance, making sure that we are covering and preparing our students for the world as it is and as it will be. Uh, and so as the world is changing, we're uh, adapting to that. So as you'll see, analytics has become a very important part of our curriculum as that has become more uh, relevant in the world. We also wanna make sure that we focus on impact, that what we do matters both for our students while they're here and for the, uh, our employers that, uh, that hire our students and for the communities in the world in which our students will graduate to. So obviously we look at our alumni and what they accomplished as our points of pride in what we've, that we've actually done, what we sought out to do. And finally, we focus on community. We wanna make sure that everyone feels welcome and included and we take advantage of all the gifts and all the perspectives that are brought into the Robbins School and into the University of Richmond. So community is very important. We see ourselves as a family. Uh, and that's really uh, exciting for us. Um, when our students join the Robin School, we ask them to make a commitment about what it means to be a member of our community. Uh, as you see there on the left, this is part of the declaration ceremony pledge, if you will, that they make. And they, uh, they, they, they uh, commit to acting with integrity, being ethical, uh, striving for excellence, being collaborative, inclusive, and supportive, and using their skills for the greater good. Uh, you'll see here from our inaugural declaration ceremony. Obviously, we're not standing that close without masks right now, but uh, I just thought that was such a, a great picture, and you'll see the ceremony there. So we'll have some version of this, whether virtual or in person, this semester as well. So we're looking forward to that. We want to make sure people know what it means to be a member of the Robin School family. Uh, why do we think we're special? What makes us different? There's four elements to that. One, we, uh, we're a unique uh, business school in that we have a liberal arts foundation. I'll talk about what that means here in a second. We have a broad business curriculum. Laura will focus a little bit on that. Uh, we, we, uh, we, we, we teach our students about the breadth of business and that actually makes them much more adaptable, much more impactful when they go into organizations and allows them to perform really, really well. And we hear that from employers over and over again. We have experiential learning components that actually uh, allow our students to apply what they learn. And as a core value for the school, we're student-centered. We wanna make sure we do what's in the best interest of our students. Uh, and that's true for the entire university. And that's the reason I'm here. And I, that's the reason everybody in the Robin School family, faculty and staff are, are here. All right, so I mentioned the Liberal Arts Foundation. We are part of the University of Richmond. We are all uh, one uh, inter in interlocking, um, educational institution. And what it means to be part of the Liberal Arts Education Foundation is that I believe that business does not operate in a vacuum. It's important for our students to understand the context under which business operates. And boy, have we not seen that even more during this pandemic. We've seen the biological healthcare context. We've seen the social context with social justice. Uh, we've seen the economic context. Uh, and, and political and otherwise. So we see that all of these things impact economic activity and impact the needs of business. So it's very important that our students get exposed to the world, to the human condition, uh, to history, uh, psychology, all of that, which actually will allow them to be better uh, and more impactful business people. Uh, we have a robust general education curriculum grounding our students and giving them skills such as critical thinking, great communication skills, we have a lot of cross-school interactions and some uh, cross-disciplinary uh, majors that our students uh, can, can take advantage of, which makes them very well-rounded and very attractive uh, to uh, employers. And actually, because we're a liberal arts institution, we focus on very small classes, which creates for a very intimate uh, and tight-knit community where our students get to know their faculty members and have some really uh, great interaction. So I think that's really important. That's one of the main reasons why our faculty that we do hire come to the University of Richmond. All right, so then we get to brag about what it is that we're here to do, which is to educate our students and inspire them. So our students do all kinds of great things. They, may, they win national competitions. So here on the left was the winning team from the last year's national diversity case competition at the University uh, of Indiana, Indiana University, and the national team selling competition. They both beat out much bigger schools uh, and schools that you, uh, you would be very impressed. And so if you wanna to go to those websites and see all the teams that we beat, they're just phenomenal. Our students really, really, really shine in the national stage. 
They're recognized leaders. Poets and Quants is a leading uh, business uh, school um, publication. Recognized two of our recent graduates, Hannah Lenkler, who was our Student Government Association president last year, and Claire Griffith, who was general manager of our Student Managed Investment Fund, as well as AKSI, one of our business uh, fraternities uh, here at the school. Just phenomenal students, and they were just strong leaders, and we're certainly going to miss them, but there's a whole nother crop of leaders coming up uh, right behind them. We see here our Gabby, uh, who got a Fulbright Scholar. She was actually the, the uh, head of the, uh, the, the leader in the National Diversity Team Selling uh, Competition. And she was also a dancer. She was a dance major. So we have very, um, uh, very uh, diverse students from in terms of interest. We see Sila here, uh, who started Spider Advertising. So she was very much uh, interested in creating experiential opportunities to apply what she's learning uh, in terms of marketing and advertising. So very, very much in trying to do something new. And she's left that legacy on for students uh, that are coming after her. They make a positive impact. Austin Kurtz went out and studied abroad and ended up uh, getting involved in, the, in, in a non-governmental agency uh, that provides healthcare in Ghana. And Austin has come back and uh, is learning more about business and how they can uh, you, how he can use those business skills to go out and make a positive impact. One of our students, when he was back in New York, when we shut down in March, uh, turned his business and was able to uh, use his uh, tent business to create uh, opportunities for uh, hospitals who needed to expand their space to do some of the uh, assessment that they needed during the pandemic. Our students start businesses. We're very much focused on innovation and entrepreneurship. We had two students who were able to uh, uh, partner our students with alumni with startups created this company that called Leva, uh, and they placed last summer 35 students in, uh, in entrepreneurial ventures, and they were use, able to use the Richmond Guarantee, which is $4,000 the university provides to every student to do a experiential, whether it be research on campus or an, in, uh, an internship. And here we see Anthony Moody, who's running a clothing uh, store, a clothing uh, business uh, here out of his dorm room, and he's actually uh, done really, really well, and we're very proud of Anthony. All right, so here's the plan for the rest of the night. We're going to go through each one of these, and I'm going to ask each uh, of our panelists to, uh, uh, and, and I'm driving the slide, so please let me know if you need me to go to the next slide. I think I know where you want me to switch, uh, but let's go ahead and start with Joyce. Joyce will give us a little bit of an insight into our faculty. Well, first, let me thank everyone for taking time to join us this evening. And I think I have the most fun part of this presentation because I get to talk about our faculty. And as Mickey mentioned, our school is special and our faculty is what makes one of the things that makes our school so special. All of our classes are taught by our faculty, not by graduate assistants or teaching assistants. And over 90% of our classes are taught by full-time faculty members. Many of our professors, like myself, come from a professional background and then go into academics. I'm an accounting professor and a certified public accountant. And at this point, still most of my career was spent in the profession. And I know that that helps inform my teaching just as it does for my colleagues who come from professional backgrounds. We understand what it means to be working in the business environment. Our professors are among the best in the country. Joe Hoyle, our accounting professor, was the first recipient of the J. Michael and Mary Ann Cook Deloitte Foundation Prize. And this is an award that's given once each year to the one individual who consistently demonstrates the attributes of a superior teacher. He also was named as one of the 100 most influential members of the accounting profession in the United States by Accounting Today. Joe's a tough professor, but he is also well-liked. He was recognized by Business Week as one of 22 favorite undergraduate business school professors in the United States. We do, as Mickey said, keep our classes small so that there can be an interaction between faculty and students. All of our classes have no more than 30 students, even our introductory courses. And our business core courses, our average class size is 22. And those core courses are the ones that all business students need to take. This small class size does provide the opportunity for our professors and our students to get to know each other. Now, not only are our faculty dedicated teachers, but they are also distinguished scholars. Management professor Jeff Harrison has been recognized by the university as both a distinguished educator and a distinguished scholar. He is an internationally recognized author in the area of stakeholder theory. 
our students have the ability to work with our professors in research work. They can either work with a professor as a research assistant, or they can conduct their own research through an independent study guided by a professor. This past summer, I have a couple of good examples. Um, we had one student who was a marketing student and they conducted a project and wrote a paper and it was titled Cultural Differences Between China and the United States in COVID-19 Storytelling Ads. Another student who's studying urban economics analyzed the housing market in a paper titled The Effect of Various Functional Forms in the Hedonic Price Function. And these are our undergraduate students working with their professors on their research projects. Now, both of these students were able to use the Richmond Guarantee, what Vicki had spoken about earlier, to work on these projects. So you're probably at this point wondering, well, this sounds great. So how does a student become a business major? So I'm gonna turn it over to Dean Thompson, who's gonna provide us that information. Thank you all. Thank you, Joyce. Laura? Well, I have to admit, I kind of um, sneaked a peek at the registration list, and I am excited to say that based on looking at families' last names, I have actually met already a lot of your students, um, for those of you who are attending. So if you ask them, hey, have you had a chance to talk to Laura or Ms. Thompson or Dean Thompson, they call me various things, um, chances are likely you're probably going to say yes. If they say not yet, definitely tell them to get to see me. Um, so basically uh, what I tend to suggest that uh, that how I will interface with your uh, student is in sort of a way to help them uh, decide what classes to pick in the first year and then what majors to pick in the second year and then what resources to use around the school in the other years so to specifically talk about kind of I think what a lot of times they're thinking about is you know, maybe I want to declare a major, and so how do I get into the business school? You might hear them say that. Um, if we want to move ahead to the next slide, Mickey, um, then you'll see there that it kind of, it tells what you have to do to declare a major. I don't really like to say you have to get in because that makes it sound like we're trying to keep people out and we're not. Um, we basically say, if you do these things, then you can declare your major. So the things that this, your student needs to do um, is uh, first take some classes. So a lot of times if uh, your students are a first year student with us, a first semester student, they may have Econ 101 on their schedule. That's the class that we call um, Principles of Microeconomics. That's a typical kind of class to take in your first year. And the uh, second semester, they might take the next class they have to take, which is the one that Joyce teaches sometimes. And that's Accounting 201, which is Financial Accounting. And then they also are supposed to take a calculus course. And I didn't put, put, put a specific number because sometimes students have brought in calculus from their high school by taking maybe an AP calculus. Uh, some might hop already straight into calculus too, but if they're just wanna take the basic calculus for us, that class is called Math 211. So those three classes, the concept being that the econ's the theory of business, the accounting sort of the practical side of business and the calculus addresses a quantitative side of business. Um, so that's kind of why they pick those three classes. Um, they also have to earn 12 units. So as you may have remembered kind of thinking about your student's admissions process, every student at Richmond starts off undeclared. And so even though they might be taking classes in the business school or with the business school, they still are undeclared until they, uh, in their sophomore year, which is typically when you declare a major. And for us, you have to earn at least 12 units. So that usually happens. Students kind of naturally have earned 12 units by midpoint of their sophomore year. Uh, some students may have already brought in class units with AP credits, so they might be ready to declare at the beginning of sophomore year, but most of the time it's that midpoint of junior year. And other than the classes and the units, they do have to have earned a grade point average of at least a 2.7, uh, which is kind of a B minus, uh, not in any realm impossible to attain at the university. So uh, that shouldn't be too daunting, but at the same point, um, just sort of a suggestion to students of the realistic nature that a lot of times employers may be looking at students' grade point averages. And so it just kind of helps remind them just to stay focused on 
continuing to be to bring excellence to their studies. Uh, but beyond that 2.7, we also have a requirement of uh, being uh, proficient in the uh, software Excel. So we call, we have a so, an Excel competency assessment that students may take as soon as they get here and before they uh, actually declare. Um, so when it comes to what you declare, we have lots of choices. So Mickey, if we can hop ahead to that next slide, you can see that there's uh, lots of things that you can study. Uh, all of our students are working toward a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration. And if you listen to those letters, the BSBA, you can see that it, in a way it's kind of mirrored as a bachelor, um, sort of like an MBA, but at the bachelor level. And I say that because in terms of course, coursework, whether it's a major or a concentration, our students are actually going to be taking classes in all of these. So we have kind of that broad-based curriculum that they start off with. And then when they're ready to declare uh, their major, their concentration, or their concentration, that's when they kind of stack up a specialty on top of that. So our students who are all earning a Bachelor of Science of Business Administration take the same classes. Again, when they choose their major, their concentration, that's when they get the specialty. So talking about those, um, the three majors we have to choose from, you can see those there. Business administration. If you choose business administration, if your student chooses business administration, they have to choose a concentration. And so that's sort of to give them a, a specialty, a niche area. Uh, if they choose accounting as a major, they may choose a concentration. And if they choose economics as a major, they may choose um, a uh, they may choose a concentration, but they don't have to. Um, you can see the concentration areas. We have um, lots of combinations, some more quantitative, some more creative, some more people oriented. And then also if your students here at Richmond and they chose Richmond because they love the liberal arts appeal of the university, they may actually be considering a major in the Art School of Arts and Sciences or a major in the Jepson School of Leadership. And in that case, it might be fun for them to choose a minor in the Robbins School. And those minors would be entrepreneurship or a minor in business. Uh, so the majors and the concentrations in the first two boxes are, are housed for Robbins School majors, right? the students, and then the minors are for our non robin school majors. Uh, but, you know, again, as we work through from this first year all the way through to senior year, our goal is, a third slide, please, Mickey, that, that's our goal. Um, eventually, hopefully, to get us all together in the Robin Center for a graduation. Um, but our goal is to get your student to graduation and to get them to graduation with something that not only is something that they um, need to do for a degree, but also something that they're excited that they want to do with a balance of classes that are both liberal arts and business specific. And again, I'm very excited to get to know your students. Um, you know, we've gotten them here, right here to Richmond, whether they're studying remotely or whether they're studying with us. And a lot of them, once we get them here, are actually kind of excited to go someplace else um, when they, we think about study abroad. So I'm gonna pass off um, our part of the program now to Associate Dean Tom Cosse, who can talk about that. Uh, thank you, Laura. Uh, again, I say it's a pleasure for me to be, be with all of you uh, tonight. Uh, the Center for International Business uh, excuse me, deals uh, with, with five basic areas, study abroad, the international business concentration, international exchange students, international visiting scholars, and MBA, the MBA international residency. We take internationalization very, very seriously at the Robbins School, and we want all of our students to have an international experience of uh, of some kind that includes graduate and certainly our undergraduate students. Uh, it seems to me that uh, for 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 you, probably the most interesting thing is the study abroad uh, program. And what I'd like to do is let some students tell that story. So we've got a short video for you to uh, view. Thank you. Well, I studied abroad in Turkey. Um, I was in Ankara, which is the capital. I didn't know much about it, and that was part of what drew me to that part of the world to begin with. Um, I was always looking at a bunch of places that I'd never been because I wanted to go somewhere I didn't think that 
I'd have the chance to visit if I didn't go while I was abroad. I studied abroad in Kenya for one semester, the fall of 2012, um, and then in the spring I studied in Thailand. I was looking between a few places, like I was looking at Prague and Vienna. I actually had a conversation with Dr. Kose that said, can I be an international business major and still do a non-business study abroad program? And I ultimately chose Vienna because they have a great business school there and I just thought it was a really cool, interesting place to go. So that's what I did in Kenya was a program that focused on health and community development. Um, so it sort of had the economic side and also the health side. There were at times where I felt like why did I come? Why did I go abroad? Why did I go to Thailand? And then before I knew it, about a month and a half to two months later, I was really beginning to appreciate the culture, the country, the people, um, the school, and I couldn't have asked for anything better. I was contemplating not leaving. I didn't want to come home. The academic experience that I had there, I have absolutely drawn upon in my classes back at Richmond this past year. I got to take classes at NUIG that I probably wouldn't have gotten to take at Richmond or during my college experience. I actually wish everyone could take the study abroad program because I learned so much about it and got so much from it. Coming back and working with students from other countries, working with students even from other parts of America, you really uh, start to understand uh, the depth to which your experiences and the lenses through which you view the same experiences and the same exposures are actually really different. I have already signed a job offer for next year and through that interview process I talked extensively about my study abroad experience. It's something that you stand out because of it and so immediately someone is more interested in speaking with you. We also took a trip to another nearby state, um, the border of Thailand and Burma, and we were swimming with elephants in a man-made lake. Suddenly, one of my friends like looking on the computer and sees that the southern lights are out. We all get, hop in the car and drive up to this hill and we see, are able to see the southern lights. Even most people that live in New Zealand have never seen it. And I just, it was just like awesome. And just thinking about it, you can see the smile on my face. Um, it was like nothing I ever experienced. It was quite incredible. Well, the, uh, the thing I can say is that I think I have the best job in the world. I've been here a long time. I could have retired a long time ago, uh, but they're going to have to wheelbarrow me out. I have the greatest amount of fun dealing with these youngsters and seeing the changes in them when they get back from study abroad. Uh, the, 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 the opening up of their eyes to new things, new people, uh, discovering new things about themselves, learning how to cope in a different environment uh, where, you know, sometimes we joke that Richmond is a bit of a bubble. We take care of our students, but it's good for them to get out someplace where they really have to take care of themselves. I can tell you stories about uh, a, a young girl who uh, went to uh, study at uh, at Vacona University in Milan, Italy. She arrives at the airport on Sunday. She had made arrangements for a car to pick her up. It didn't show. She found a, a cab and the airport there is empty on Sunday. She found a cab to take her to the uh, uh, temporary residence she had. The cab driver decided that he didn't think that was the best part of town for her and he took her someplace else. Uh, she was all excited about that. But there are so many, so many stories uh, that these kids will tell when they get back from, uh, from study abroad. And the other thing is it does, uh, it, it does give them a bit of an edge when they're out in the job market. Um, students who do the international business concentration, for example, I tell them they should have a second concentration in one of the functional areas like marketing or economics or finance or consulting, that that will get them their first job but the international business concentration will get them where they want to be and it will make them uh, unique. We have 
partnerships. We're very selective in where we send our students. We have partnerships with 48 schools in 28 different countries. When I first started this job several years ago, or many years ago, I guess I should say, we were sending perhaps 20 students abroad in a year. Now, over 60% of our undergraduates will have had an international experience by the time they graduate from the University of Richmond. And most of those students will have spent, and I say most, I mean you know, right at 60%, will have spent a full semester abroad and some will have actually spent uh, an academic year abroad. Some actually double up. They'll do summers abroad as well as a full semester abroad. So it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity for the students. And I do hope you, you tell your students to come see me. I like to start working with them early in their academic uh, career to figure out where they might like to go and see which, what fits with their uh, their course of study. Now that doesn't mean study abroad is automatic. They have to apply, they have to meet certain grade requirements and so on, they have to write an essay, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we do our very best to place all of our students because we want them to have an overseas or an international experience. Um, I'll turn it over to, uh, to Shelly now. She can tell you about the other experiences that help round out these students. Great. Well, thank you, Tom. And um, good evening, everyone. I'd like to, um, next slide. I'd like to begin with a, next slide, please. I'd like to begin with a quote from Simon Sinek, who is a British um, author. And this is a quote he was addressing some millennials and Gen Zers and uh, about careers. And he says, quote, everything you want, you can have instantaneously. Everything you want, instant gratification. Everything except strength of relationships and job satisfaction. There ain't no app for that. Um, at the Center for Professional Skills and Development, our focus is on helping students to build and maintain relationships for a shared positive outcome. We do that through experiential learning, and we also do that um, through engagement and um, trying to help students connect and make connections while they're on campus and also beyond. So how do we do that? Next slide. So this is a picture on the left. We have a business boot camp uh, every January. Laura talked about students formally declaring in January. We tie our conference into that declaration. Um, so on the left, this is what we typically taught students at our big boot camp, which is for sophomores, about 150 students. Uh, there is no cost for them to attend and it's really um, and there's no particular structure. We just it's first come first serve basically so anybody can any business student major or minor can join. But if you think about the left side here, we typically taught students about how to introduce themselves, their eye contact, um, the handshake. And we start with peer to peer. I'm a big believer in the power of peer to peers. And so in this particular conference, they're learning that. And then a little bit later, they'll do a one-on-one -on -one mock coaching session with one of our corporate partners or alumni or parents. And then a little bit later, at, toward the end of the conference, they'll have a chance to put it all together and actually uh, network with employers, alumni, faculty, et cetera. The challenge for us in trying to stay relevant is that, as you can see on the right, and with COVID-19, so much of these professional skills, and we talk about hard skills, we're in the business of soft skills, but I like to call them power skills. Um, so we are, we're having to pivot just like everybody else. So for our, our Q Camp conference this coming January, we're gonna talk a lot about virtual engagement, such as how do you present yourself well on Zoom? Virtual interviews, we know that our employers have entirely gone virtual this fall and we need to help educate our students on how to do that. Um, and so we do a number of different conferences. QCamp is one of them. Next slide, please. So just a couple of quick learning outcomes in addition. Uh, we really want our students, they, we don't expect them to know what they wanna do as a sophomore. Why? Because they don't know what they don't know. And for many of them, they have not even had a class in their concentration or major. But what we do expect them to do is to get out of their comfort zone. Um, so we want them to understand what the resources are on campus. We also want them to understand what are the core career readiness competencies that our employers are expecting them. As you all know, these power skills take time to develop. And, and so we believe that beginning first year, these are the kind of skills we can develop for our students. Um, and then Q2 is actually an internship prep 
uh, for their summer internships. So we want our sophomores through seniors to get brushed up on getting ready for their summer experience. As you all know, there's a lot of unwritten rules and expectations and we wanna make sure our students have every competitive advantage. Next slide. Mentoring, I'm a huge proponent and we, we know and the research supports that mentoring can have a significant impact um, on, our, on our students. Um, one of our student organizations, the Robin School SGA, just this fall um, instituted a pilot mentoring program. They have about 140 students. Um, it's peer to peer. So the mentees are the first and second year students. The mentors are the junior and senior business students. My role within the center is to serve as an advisor um, toward the students who are overseeing that program. In addition, we have a, a mentoring program for junior and senior business students. Our mentors are alumni, their parents, their corporate partners, and the expectation is that they meet one on one on a monthly basis. Um, and so you'll see on the right here, this is an example of an alumna who is meeting with a student. Because of COVID, we'll go virtual, but it doesn't mean we won't um, have an impactful opportunity to teach them some of these virtual power skills. So mentoring is a big part of, of what we do here. Next. Um, in terms of our super mentors, we have um, executives and residents, also known as EIRs. And these are C-levels, CEO, COO, CFO. Um, they are, several of them are alumni, uh, Steve Aronson, John Fela. Um, so all of them have had experience um, managing companies and corporations. A number of them have had experience uh, creating, selling, um, companies and working with our students to help their interests and develop their tools for entrepreneurship. In addition to, um, they, they actually have a chance to meet one-on-one -on -one with your student, including first year. Uh, go to the website, encourage your student to look up their bio, their contact information, and we ask them to reach out to them directly. If they want a little help with that, I'm happy to coach them along, but our EIRs are, are a fabulous resource. And lastly, next slide, please. In addition to the, the curriculum or the, the, um, the workshops that we do to provide experiential learning, we also believe that um, student organizations, uh, not just in the business school, but across campus, provide wonderful leadership opportunities. Um, I, within the Center of the of Professional Skills, I work very closely with the student leaders. Um, they all have faculty advisors, and um, we work to help them to uh, reach goals, if they wanna do special projects, if they wanna network out in the community, um, and they do a lot of really terrific things. So um, in, in, in summary, um, I think a lot of what we're looking to do is preparing students for life after, um, after U of R. And um, so I'm gonna turn things over to Keith Webb. Keith and I actually um, have a really nice collaboration and partnership and uh, our students do very, very well um, and a lot because of Keith and his uh, team's efforts. Keith? Well, thank you, Shelley. Very, thank you very much. And good evening, everyone, once again, and thank you for being a part of this session. I'm gonna spend a few minutes just talking about the process that we share with your student on a day-to-day -day basis to position them for career success. Next slide, please. So we generally start this process off in terms of what we offer. Obviously, the conversation revolves around a resume and cover letter. There's a great deal of focus that's done on that in the initial meetings that we have with the students. And then we step into the process of career exploration. There are assessments that we conduct as well. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, there's interview preparation and mock interviews as well, internship search. And then Mickey alluded to this a little bit earlier in terms of the summer fellowship, which I will talk about uh, in a few moments. Next slide, please. In terms of programs, we generally offer well over 100 programs per academic year. Some years it tops out at about 150. Uh, we have programs that are focused on resume and cover letter workshops and LinkedIn workshops and so many other things as well. We have an industry focus specifically on some of the names that you see here, but certainly much more than what you see on the screen in terms of accounting, consulting, finance, marketing, science, health, innovation, and entrepreneurship. And then we have some pretty large series of events that take place on the annual basis, whether it's in the fall semester or the spring. We just hosted our Deconstructing Wall Street event this past Saturday, which was a wonderful hit where we had a keynote speaker, a 1986 alumna come back and provide 30 minutes of uh, wonderful wisdom that she shared with the students that I'm sure they uh, took to heart and will utilize in very instrumental and meaningful ways as well. 
We have an upcoming event and we'll talk more about events, events in a few moments, but we have a deconstructing health event which will take place on October 24th. And then for our students that are interested in accounting, we have our accounting fest event which will take place on October 27th. Next slide, please. In terms of critical resources, and this is what I really want you to talk with your students about because everything essentially revolves around the Spider Connect career management system itself. So whether your student is looking for externship or internship opportunities or some of the events that I mentioned and those, uh, the many others that I have not mentioned to this point, whether they're looking to access the employer database to create networking connections with employers, where they can make appointments with myself or my colleagues or drop in appointments where they have the opportunity just to uh, basically sign into a link and spend 15 minutes with any of the advisors, myself or anyone else that's willing to help them and answer any question they may have in the spur of the moment. There are other resources that are available all through Spider Connect, as I mentioned a moment ago, vault guides, which are industry profession related guides that are great help guides. They essentially provide the one-on-ones of whether it's accounting or marketing or international business or whatever the case may be. So we recommend that your student takes advantage of this resource, which again is accessible through uh, Spider Connect. Uh, interview stream, if your student wants to practice mock interviewing, we recommend that you take advantage of this particular tool as well. And I mentioned a moment ago, assessments, where students may want to take advantage of where they are uh, in terms of certain assessment tools that we have available to them. Whether it's the Myers-Briggs type indicator or the strong in interest inventory itself. And Shelley alluded to the great collaboration that takes place you know, between Career Services and the Robbins School of Business in general. Uh, we facilitated that, or administered, I should say, with her help, the strong interest inventory to 150 students that participated in this past January's QCAM. So that's just part of the cross-pollination, if you will, that takes place between Career Services and the Robbins School of Business. Next slide, please. In terms of opportunities in the Career Opportunity Fund and the, uh, the Summer Fellowship itself, uh, we spoke a few moments ago about externships in terms of length of time. They can be anywhere from one day to five days in length. It really depends on the employer and how they're providing that particular opportunity. The key thing to remember about externships, they typically lead to full-time internship opportunities the following summer of the externship itself. In terms of internships, they generally take place during the summer. They can be anywhere between five to 12 weeks in length. Uh, depending upon the opportunity, it could be 40 hours per week if it's investment banking, I say you can double that number. Uh, and they generally lead to full-time employment opportunities after graduation. There's a couple of funding opportunities that I wanna to mention to you. Uh, one is the Career Opportunity Fund where students can utilize this fund uh, once per academic year that they're with the University of Richmond to offset any cost they may incur for professional attire. So say if they wanna buy a skirt suit or a pant suit or whatever the case may be, they will be reimbursed for the purchase of those items. And these fees can also cover graduate and professional application fees as well. Uh, Mickey talked a little bit earlier in his presentation about the summer fellowship. This is a great opportunity for students that are seeking opportunities to gain experience, that experiential learning component that we talked about as part of our principles where they can receive up to $4,000 for unpaid internships or research opportunities. Next slide, please. So here's some action steps, parents and families that I'd love for you to keep in mind and share with your students or reinforce with them when I'm not in the room with them as well. Uh, spend some time getting to know, getting familiarized with the Spider Connect system and its resources. It's a pretty vast system. Uh, it requires you or the user to utilize the system as often as possible to become accustomed to it as well. Uh, they can utilize the system, as I mentioned before, to schedule an appointment with myself or any of the other advisors that work in career services. We often encourage them to utilize the system to check the calendar. There are all sorts of opportunities, programs, as I mentioned before, that are happening daily. Uh, employers are posting job positions on the site as well on a daily basis, so we encourage them to take advantage of that. And the best way to do that is by viewing the system at least twice a day. I recommend in the morning and the evening just to get a sense of what's there. And if there's something that relates to their experience or their interest, they should take advantage of that as uh, soon as possible when they see it. They should also sign up for our industry newsletters. There are about seven different industry newsletters that we recommend they take advantage of. Those are typically released every Sunday morning at about 10 a.m. And of course, we encourage you and your student to visit careerservices.richmond.edu for all of the resources that we've talked about this evening and more. Next slide, please. 
And I just wanted to share this before turning things back over to Dean Quinones. Uh, this is a short list of some of the fall events that we've hosted so far. So you can see on the left of your screen between September 10th and October 12th, these are some of the major events that we hosted that covers a number of different industry related areas. And then as you can see, starting tomorrow, we have an application deadline for banking boot camp. This is a four week program, which I will be facilitating myself to teach students the, the 100s, if you will, um, of banking or investment banking for that matter. Uh, there's a LinkedIn workshop. We ask students to you know, create a LinkedIn profile. If you're not certain about what that process is or how to do that, we ask you to, or ask your student to participate in this workshop itself. I referred a little bit earlier to Deconstructing Health on October 24th and Accounting Fest on the 27th. There's also an event for uh, spiders who are interested in social impact. This is a wonderful opportunity. We ask students to engage in if this is of their interest as well. And then we have uh, just for one notification, one of many, many that takes place in terms of the big four office hours where a lot of the alumni that work at certain firms, KPMG in particular, come back to University of Richmond looking to coach the spiders and position them for career opportunities at their respective firms. And lastly, I just wanna share some very quick data with you in terms of our 2019 first destination survey. So in the class year of 2019, 293 students graduated from the University of Richmond's Richmond School of Business. Um, of that number, 271 responded to our FDS survey. 229 landed full-time opportunities. 16 went on to continue their education on a graduate level. Eight were interested in post-graduation internship opportunities. At the time of the survey, which ended on December of 2019, 16 were still seeking and two were not seeking to total the number of 271. And lastly, the average salary of those that landed opportunities is just under $66,000 per year. So thank you so much for the time to share this with you. I'm looking forward to answering any questions you may have. And Mickey, I turn things back over to you. All right, thank you everyone. As you can see, we have a great team uh, and this is just a sampling of all of the people in our school and our university that are devoted to ensuring that your student has a great educational opportunity that will prepare them to have the kind of outcomes that they wanna have and they make the kind of difference they wanna make out in the world. So now I will go through, let me just stop sharing here. Not sure if everybody can see everyone, but you'll certainly be able to see who's talking. Uh, and I'll go through some of your questions. We have about 12 minutes here. Um, let's, uh, let's see, Laura, how about the Excel competency assessment? How do they prepare for that? Um, I, we have on our, our website, our Robin School website, there's a link that talks about the content areas that are assessed uh, for Excel. And for each of those areas, there is a video that a student can watch and also some uh, corresponding worksheets that they can practice with. That's an option. We also have another video. And then we have an elective within our curriculum called software tools that students may elect if they wish also to take that class. Great, thank you. Tom, what about uh, study abroad? I know that there's some uncertainty there. We just heard some things about that. One of our parents wants to know if there's gonna be a meeting for current sophomores in the near future about what's happening in the spring. Uh, this, this spring, we, uh, we actually are sending some students abroad uh, to selected uh, countries. Spring is usually a very uh, uh, light period for students wanting to study abroad. Most of our kids study abroad in the fall. And uh, we will be having information systems, uh, uh, I'm sorry, information sessions for students about the study abroad process, uh, what they have to do, what's going to be available. And of course, we work very closely with the University International Education Group. And it's that group, along with the senior administration, that is making the calls, if you will, on uh, COVID-19 and whether or not students can go abroad. In fact, whether or not faculty can go abroad right now. So we, we, we're doing, our, we hope that things will open up in the fall. But of course, right now we've got some countries that won't even let us in. So how do they find out? And is it in this information sessions where they'll learn about the process for applying and what the oh, yes. various programs are? And how do they find out about the sessions? Will they be getting an email? Those are notified on it. It's on Spider Bytes and also the, uh, the, the video uh, uh, videos around uh, campus. So yeah, we, we, uh, we, we get the word out on that pretty well. 
The and I usually send is, them an email to remind them. Yeah. And the other, other thing is all they have to do, well, it's a little difficult now to drop by the office since most people are working from home, but all they have to do is email me or uh, my two staff members, Faye Bell and uh, Kim uh, Doran, and we'll get right back in touch with them. Yeah. In fact, that's a great point. Please encourage your students just because some of our faculty are uh, coming to class and then you know, trying to de-densify the campus, we are still just as accessible. So drop us a line. We can have Zoom meetings. We can have in-person meetings, socially distanced, if, some, if, if somebody's willing to do that. Uh, I've met with quite a few students over the semester, and it's, it's, uh, we're still here. We're still yeah. here. And I've been meeting with students about study abroad uh, for the future uh, via Zoom and other virtual uh, programs. Yeah, and, and as, as Laura said, if she encourage your students to read any email that Laura sends out, <laughs> it'll probably be uh, something that they need to know. Uh, Shelly, what about Q Camp? If somebody is a minor, um, so they're A and S student and they're an entrepreneurship or business minor, do they have access to Q Camp as some of the other programs? Absolutely. We we really want to be as inclusive across campus as much as possible, and. Uh, we take majors and minors um, across campus. Great. Uh, let's see. Joyce, I know you in your classes, do you use Excel? Somebody's asking if we use Excel in classes. Yes, we do. We use Excel in quite a few of the classes, not just in accounting, but in finance extensively and in our management courses as well. Yeah. In fact, our students get exposed to all the leading um, analytic tools that are out there. In fact, we just had a, several meetings about that. Our analytics concentration is, uh, is, is up full and running and uh, they get exposed to Python, to machine learning and a bunch of other kinds of tools. So they'll be very well prepared. Somebody was asking whether they should get an MBA coming out of here. If they're a Robin School major, uh, the MBA is something you don't need for a, when you're going up to your first managerial position, get some experience out there. Our students compete head to head, and they do very, very well, as you heard from Keith, uh, in terms of the uh, employment outcomes. Will freshmen be able to interact with the Robin School? Um, and maybe I can take that, our the awesome. first class, go ahead. I'm happy to take that too. They definitely interact. And many of our um, first year students will take account, well, they'll take Econ 101 often in their first semester and they'll take Accounting 201. So they get right into it as a first year in their second semester in spring semester. So yes, they can. And Mickey, if I could just say that um, if any student is interested in exploring a particular club or organization, have them reach out to me directly. I would be very happy to talk with them. Some, uh, some of the student organizations have particular recruiting times, others do not. So happy to talk personally with the student and get them connected. Mickey, I just wanna add something real quick that you know, we often speak with a lot of first year students because there's an advising component you know, from an academic standpoint as well with our jobs. And we have such touch points as this uh, presentation tonight would demonstrate with all of the faculty and other members. So it gives us an opportunity to share with students. So please encourage your students, especially for the first year parents that are out there to sit down with us, as well as my colleagues that are on the call. Yeah, so there's a question here, and Keith, if you wanna stay on. So how does the Robin School bridge the gap between courses, majors and minors and actual jobs and career paths? It's really hard to give young people a good perspective or view of the professional business ecosystem. How do you orient our students into what they can link up between what they're studying and what jobs are out there. So generally we start with more than just one 30 minute meeting. Um, but what I normally do when I sit down with the students, I really ask them, well, what are you passionate about? What are some of the things that you have an inkling of a premonition of right now? And we'll start prioritizing and putting in preferential order what those things are, and then start matching those up with the types of uh, academic opportunities that are out there as well. And then from that, we hope to extrapolate and just get them on a path that makes them most comfortable. Sometimes it may lead to an assessment, or it just may be myself or my colleagues just helping the students to really understand what the opportunities are out there at the University of Richmond, and then aligning them with the various programs and workshops that are there to make sure that they're walking in the right direction and uh, ultimately reaching their goal by the time they graduate. Yeah, and it's important to stress that the programs that you described, the deconstructing programs and others, they involve alumni and, 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 and recruiters. Um, so the students, 
are exposed to individuals out in the business world, either through their classes, through our EIRs, through, uh, through some of these programs from uh, Shelly Shop and, and Keith. Uh, so they get to hear their path. How did they get to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the particular position that they're in? And what are they looking for in terms of skill sets and interests and so on? So we expose our students that they're coming to our executive speaker series. They're coming from all these uh, programs that Shelly puts on and all these programs that Keith puts on. They'll get a good view about what it takes and how you link what you're interested in, what you're studying with what's required and what's what the changing nature of the workplace is. Nikki, just 10 more seconds. I want to, one of the things I mentioned to students that's very important that undergrad is about exploration. So take advantage of all the opportunities that are there, explore and then align accordingly. Okay, Joyce? Yes, we had a question that somebody submitted before our session asking about whether or not we had a fast track master's in accounting program. And I just wanted to talk to that, talk about that. So we have a very strong accounting major here at the Robbins School, and the majority of our students are CPA ready when they graduate with our undergraduate degree. So we do not have a fast track and master's program in accounting. But when I say CPA ready, that means they meet all the educational requirements. So we're really proud of that fact. And in fact, as Keith was talking about from our accounting graduates in 2020, 94% of them had job offers, the majority from CPA firms and the majority of those are the big four CPA firms who love to recruit our students. Yes, uh, the, the accounting firms love our students for certain. Somebody asked about the analytics major. So mm -hmm. um, our majors are really our concentrations and there is a, a business analytics uh, concentration and it's growing and it's, uh, and it's actually a second concentration. You have to have a, another concentration because analytics is uh, being used in every functional area, whether it be marketing, finance, human resources, whatever, it's all becoming much more analytic uh, driven and those tools are really important. So that's why we require that to be a second concentration. Mm, let's see. Is there a deadline for applying to Q Camp, Shelley? We will send that out this uh, fall uh, to all sophomore business students, majors and minors. So they'll be getting that. We'll launch it in early November and probably have a December deadline, but we haven't, uh, we haven't solidified that date just yet. Okay. Laura, do you see that last question there? Why don't you take that? It's about whether there's a selection process. Um, I do see it. I was trying to toggle between the questions and making sure we were getting them answered. So yes, thank you. The question was about the selection process, if there is a rejection or an admittance process. And kind of as, as I sort of explained when we went through that, I, it's my hope that the students do understand that we want them to be able to declare. So we aren't planning to reject them. Um, if a student does, for example, not meet the grade point average criterion, that would typically be the one reason that students might need to have the option to have to go through an appeal process, which they may do. Um, and that would be basically where they would have to write a, um, a letter of advocacy to our undergraduate affairs committee to um, indicate why perhaps they weren't able to meet the requirements of declaring and then that uh, undergraduate affairs committee reviews their case and votes to decide if their appeals granted or if not. And typically if it would not be granted, it's because there is something in that student's record that leads us to believe that they might be a better fit in another major. Um, not that we don't want them in the business school, just that we see them having more success in another path. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so if they meet those criteria, then they can choose to be part of the Robin School. There's no interview process or any kind of up or down uh, so it's pretty straightforward. All right, it's eight o'clock. Uh, I hope that everyone found these uh, sessions, this session valuable. Uh, thank you all panelists for your wisdom and uh, sharing all that you do for our students. Uh, I really appreciate that. And I wanna thank all of you who attended tonight. Uh, I hope this gives you a little bit of an inside view of the Robin School. Uh, we like to think that the, uh, we're an integral part of the University of Richmond. The University of Richmond being a broad-based liberal arts institution really awakens our students to the realities of the world, our history and the context in which business operates. And the Robin School gets them ready and gives them the tools and the skill sets to go out and, and, and make a difference in that world. So 
Uh, I want to make sure that you follow us on Instagram and Facebook and look for other opportunities to connect with us. We have an executive speaker series coming up. We'll see one with Shep uh, Murray, uh, the, one of the founders of Vineyard Vines. Uh, one of the things that has come up with the uh, COVID and being virtual is that we're able to offer our programs worldwide. So you know, all of you are welcome to attend those. So uh, thanks again, panelists. Thanks again, uh, families and students and anybody else who attended. And we look forward to seeing you next time we're uh, together. Take care.